Praise God. Welcome back, church. Today, we are going to do a special message on warfare. Originally, I had planned on teaching on healing tonight, or healing uh, this morning, but uh, we're going to do warfare instead, and we're going to save healing for next time. So, if you've ever been in a fight before, you know that it's physical, right? So, spiritual warfare is quite the opposite. It's spiritual warfare for a reason. So we know then the word of God in John 16, 33, it says, These things I have spoken unto you, this is Jesus talking, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus made three points here in the scripture. Number one, Christians will experience tribulation, oppression, affliction, and distress. Number two, during this tribulation, we will have peace. That's very key um, important truth to remember that even though as Christians we will experience tribulation, you will also have peace if you're in Christ. But the third thing is, he said to be of good cheer. Why did he say that? He said to have courage and be comforted because Jesus has overcome the world. So in other words, we've already won the war. So when you go into warfare, you have to remember that every battle you go into, no matter what it is, whether, whether it's finances, whether it's health, uh, whatever it's just oppression of your mind, whatever it is, you already have the victory. God has already secured that victory in Jesus if you're looking to Jesus. But if you're looking to the things of the world to um, win the battle against a spiritual enemy, you're going to lose because you're fighting a spiritual battle. So you must fight with the spiritual tools and the spiritual tools are in the word of God. The spiritual power is in Jesus and in his name. It's not by mistake that the Bible says, or the, that Jesus told us, in my name you will have power that you will cast out devils, you will raise the dead, you will heal the sick. He says, all these things you'll do in my name if you believe, if you believe. There's always an if. God says, if you do this, I will do this. If you do this, if you believe. So we know that everything in the word of God is done by faith, especially when it comes to warfare. So, in any war, you want to know who your enemy is. And it's very, it's pretty clear. I mean, the devil's the enemy, right? But he comes in many forms. So who is our enemy? In short, it's anything or anyone that opposes God. Anything or anyone that opposes God. So let's look at some potential enemy threats. So number one, one of the things that the Bible mentions is the enemies of the cross. The enemies of the cross. These are the puppet people. These are the ones that Satan uses against you specifically and these are humans in the world so philippians 3 17 says brothers become fellow imitators with me become fellow imitators with me. I mean do what i have done because i because i'm following jesus follow me because i'm acting the way jesus acted so brothers be, become fellow imitators with me and observe those who walk according to our example after the example of christ for many other people are walking in such a way that they are the enemies of the cross of christ he says, I have told you of them often and tell you again, even weeping, that these people who are not following Jesus, these people who are enemies of the cross, Paul is crying and weeping because their destruction, their destination is destruction. Their God is their appetite, meaning they only live to serve themselves. They don't care about other people. They only live to please their own appetite. Their glory is in their shame and their minds are set on earthly things. Now, what's interesting about verse 19 he just says that they serve their own appetites, their own wants, their own desires, right? But it says their glory is in their shame. Have you ever been in a position where you did something really good and you're really proud of yourself or your spouse is proud of you and they pat you on the back and say, wow, I'm really proud of you, you did good. Well, they do that for themselves, but only in evil things. So they rejoice in doing evil. They rejoice in the things they do wrong and they're proud of it. Okay, they're proud of it. Now, look at Romans 6 and 16 and 17. It says, now I urge you, brothers, to closely watch those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the teaching which you have learned and avoid them. So he wants us to watch these people who are walking a life that is not a Christian life. He says, watch out for these people because they will cause division. So we know that the word of God causes division because 
people who will follow Jesus closely, the Bible says in Timothy that those people will be persecuted because they're living a holy life, because they're living a righteous life. They will be persecuted. Even in your own house, you will have division because of one person's yoke to the Lord and following Jesus and following God. There may be other people in that house who are not. And guess what? There's going to be division there automatically because of the word of God, because you're doing the will of God and the other person isn't. So we need to be mindful of all these people, especially the ones that are close to you in your household. Those are the ones you need to be praying for the most because you got to live with them, okay? And you don't want to abandon your family, so you got to live with them. So you got to pray for the stronghold of Satan to be broken off of those people. And it says, for the ones that we can avoid, to avoid them. For such people do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. And through smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Now, how is it through smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting? And why are they unsuspecting? The only reason why a person would be unsuspecting is because these, if these two people are familiar with each other. In other words, someone close to you, someone that you know, someone that, oh, well, he's in this Christian camp. They're, they're okay because they're Christians. Someone you're familiar with. Because if you weren't familiar with a person, you wouldn't be unsuspecting. You would be like, all right, who is this person? I don't know this person. So these are people that are close to you. So already we know that the, exposing the enemy means he's going to expose a lot of people in your own life who are not walking with God. And they're going to be the ones you're supposed to trust or be close to. But unsuspectingly, these people will use smooth talk and just people who are really good at speaking, people who are really good at convincing other people to see their view. If that person's view is evil, then he's going to try to talk you into seeing his evil view and to agree with him. And he'll say it in such a way that he's deceiving you, but you won't even realize it. There was a president who talked like that. You know who that was? Obama. He was really good at speaking. Very, very good at speaking. And boy, that boy had a slippery tongue, I'll tell you what. Anyways, I won't get into politics today, even though I'd like to. So he's saying, for such people do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. Just like the previous version, people serve their own appetites and not God. And through smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. So do not be unexpecting. Always be ready for a fight. Always look for the enemy and how he can come into your life and, and pervert the truth. Now in James 4, it says, You adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that for the friendship with the world is enmity against God? That friendship with the world is enmity against God. So remember, we're exposed to the enemy. So who's the enemy? The world. The people who do not live after the example of Jesus Christ. The people who live after the example of their own desires, their own wants their own evil, whatever it may be, whatever the Bible says that is evil, these people are living to please that evil desire in their own flesh. And it says friendship with the world is enmity against God. Enmity means hatred. So if you're a friend of the world, there's already division between you and God. Okay? Because God hates the things of the world. He loves the people. He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. He hates the things of the world. He hates what the devil does to people. He can't stand it. And we as Christians with the Spirit of God in us should be the same exact way. Amen? The same exact way. It says, Whoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Church, God has never did this um, on the fence thing. God has says, either serve me or you don't serve me. Either you're on my side or you're against me. Either you're for me and with me or you're against me. God has made it very, very clear that when it comes to being a Christian, you must choose a side. You must choose your side. There's no being in the middle. Because what does the scripture say? I would prefer you'd be hot or cold and not in the middle because I'm going to spew you out of my mouth with what God says. Because if you're lukewarm, he does not like lukewarm Christians. He wants you to either be on fire for him or be on fire for the devil, one or the other. There's no being in the middle. He says, I will spew you out of my mouth is what the scripture says. Now, these people have conformed to the image of the world and not to the image of Christ. And when it's easy to see that, we avoid them. You know, always praying for them for their deliverance, but we avoid them. So look at this. So that was number one. That was number one. So what is number two? The first one was the enemies of the cross. Those are the puppet people. We're exposing the enemy. So here, let's expose the next, uh, a next portion of the enemy. So the first one was people, right? That's a portion of the enemy. The second one is your flesh. It's yourself. Look at James, or uh, Galatians 5.17. It says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, your flesh, and the spirit against the flesh. These are in opposition to one another. So they're against each other, right? They're in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. So if you're trying to please God, 
Your flesh is going to try to keep you from pleasing God. Your flesh does not want you to walk with the Lord. He doesn't want you to do the things that Jesus requires us to do. So your own flesh will try to hinder you. Okay? That's why it's so important to have a life of fasting and prayer. That way you can subdue that desire to please the flesh and please God. He get you out of the way so God can live through you and not have your desires blocking God's will in your life. So these are in opposition to each other so that you will not be able to do the things that you please. And in James 1.14 it says, But each man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Now lust doesn't always mean sexual stuff, okay? Lust just means a strong desire to do something that's contrary to God. It doesn't have to be sexual desire. It can be any kind of desire that you're lusting to go do. You can lust over food. You can lust to go and, and spend time working on your hot rod because you'd rather do that than be with God. That is a, a strong desire of which you have no control over. Okay? does not have to be Im sexual immorality. You understand what I'm saying? So each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And when it is finished, when sin has, is done being born and produces a fruit, it brings forth death. Because death is the fruit of sin. Remember, death is the fruit of sin. Now, Paul understood the struggle and saw the flesh as an enemy threat. Now, look at what he said in Romans 7.24. He says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the, from the body of this death? I thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then, with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. So even though he spent his, every day of his life renewing his mind, he knew that there was always the potential for the flesh to overtake him. So he knew that was something that he always had to be aware of, something that he always had to keep his mind and his heart renewed to the Word of God so his flesh would not overtake him. So who is the real enemy, though, in all this? Even though we see it in people, we see the enemy working in people. We see the enemy working in with our own flesh. Because remember, we're born into a sin nature. But once we're saved, we no longer have a sin nature. We have a righteousness nature. Because we're made in the image and the likeness of God. And once we are reborn, we no longer identify with sin. We identify with righteousness and holiness. Because that's how Jesus made us. We are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 The old has passed away. All things have been made new. You are new in Christ. You are a new creation. So you can no longer say, I'm a, I'm a sinner saved by grace because there's no such thing. Either you are the righteousness of God or you're still a sinner. And if you're still a sinner, you're unsaved. That doesn't mean that Christians don't sin. Christians will always sin. But your nature is no longer that of sin. Your nature is now that of God. That of righteousness, because you were bought and redeemed with a price. The blood of Jesus covers you. You get what I'm saying? Amen? So we have to serve God, but who's the real enemy that drives and fuels these threats? Who's the enemy that drives the puppet people to do Satan's will? Who's the enemy who drives our flesh to desire wicked things? Well, it's the devil, right? Satan. The devil is behind it all. He is the puppet master. Ephesians 2.1 and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, formerly walked according to the age of this world and according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So Satan's on the loose, right? And he's doing everything he can to corrupt every single man, woman, child in this world. And he's operating in the sons of disobedience. Now, you no longer are a son or a daughter of disobedience because you are saved. But you've got to take that first step to get there. Now, what else does the Bible say about this puppet master? Now, look at 1 Peter 5 and 8. It says to be sober, to be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Now, if someone is walking around and seeking, that means they're looking for something, right? And it says here that he's looking to devour you. So you don't see him, right? Because he's in a spirit. Unless the Lord opens your eyes and you're able to see in the Spirit. But here's the deal. And you have heard me say this a hundred times. The devil is literally walking around you, stalking you, looking for a weak point. Looking for a way to interject his desires and his wills in your life. Okay? He's looking for some way to corrupt you and pull you away from God. He's looking for a way to destroy you because he hates you. Don't get me wrong. He hates you. Okay? 
he's out to get you. So even though you don't see him, he's working through people, he's working through your own flesh, and he's studying you because that's how warfare works. You study your enemy to find their weaknesses. And once you find their weaknesses, you exploit their weaknesses. And he will send people into your life to exploit your weakness. You know, for example, if, if I... Um, if I had a hard time with eating, I was just a foodaholic. I just couldn't stop eating. I just, it was uh, something I lusted after was food, and I just couldn't get away with it. If I finally came to a point where I said, God, I just can't do this anymore, and I'm going to go on a prayer, I'm going to go on prayer and fasting for a whole week. I just, I'm not going to do this anymore. I need to break this chain off of me. Well, Satan already knows the weakness. He already knows that food is my weakness. So what he would do, he'd ever, he would send every Tom, Dick, and Harry to my front door. Hey, man, let's go out to eat. Hey, we want to bring you some food. Hey, we want to make sure you have everything you eat. I don't know why. I just feel like I need to come over and give you something to eat. Why? Because Satan does not want me to break free of that stronghold. He wants that stronghold to be in my life. So he will send people in my life to make sure that he has his way in me. And he always does that through people. If he can't do it through your own desires, he will use other people to come against you, to hit you at your knees where he knows you are weak. So we have to be mindful that the enemy has eyes and ears. He's always watching. He's always listening. And he's, oh, he can always find someone to use against you. And a lot of times it's your own family. He can always find someone. That's why it's so important that the company you keep is godly company. That way he cannot use the godly people against you. At least he'll have a harder time doing it. You know what I mean? So what else does the Bible say about the devil, specifically in his character? We already know he's capable of all this, but what else does it say? Well, Philippians, Romans, James said that he's a manipulator, right? He's a puppet master. Philippians, Romans, and James said that. Now, Genesis 3 said that Satan, the serpent, is shrewd. He's sharp and crafty. Remember how he deceived Eve? So we know he's a liar. We know he's, he's very crude. He's very sharp. He's crafty. He's sly. Now, James and Romans also said that he's a tempter of the flesh. A tempter of the flesh. So he knows he likes to dangle bait out in front of you. And in John 8, 44, he said he's the tr that his true nature is revealed, revealed that he's a murderer. And he's the father of lies. What's the most important thing to know about the enemy, though? What's the most important thing? Well, look at Ephesians 6.12. Oh, I didn't realize I had that on there. There you go. So we'll look at Ephesians 6 and 12. For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So just like I said in the beginning, your enemy is spiritual. He always operates in the shadows. He always operates in the unseen realm. So even more so, you need to be on guard because you can't see the enemy physically coming at you. Sometimes you can if your eyes are open, your spiritual eyes are open. God will speak to you through, through, through dreams and through visions. But for the most part, you need to be prayed up. You need to be fasted. You need to be in the Word. You need to be instant in season and out of season. You need to always be ready for a fight. Amen? Always be ready for a fight because you have a spiritual enemy. And this means you're going to need to have spiritual weapons. Now let's look at these spiritual weapons. at 2 Corinthians 10 and 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Even though we're, in, we're human beings and we're, you know, we have flesh and bones, we don't fight with these things. We don't fight with a fist. We don't fight with guns or, or picks or whatever. I don't know what people fight with nowadays but <laughs> for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God so our weapons are through God and when you're mighty through God you're able to pull down the strongholds of the enemy food addictions are strongholds sexual perversions are strongholds um, being angry and unforgiving is a stronghold bitterness is a stronghold thinking you're better than everybody else is a stronghold those are all things that the enemy puts in place over time it doesn't happen overnight. It's over time that this stuff can happen. But the power of God is so great, you can break it off of you instantly. If you let him. If you let him work through you. So we know that our spiritual weapons are through God, who is a spirit. And they are, and the spiritual weapons are able to tear down the strongholds of the enemy. You know, a stronghold, it's simply, it's just a fortress of lies is all it is. A stronghold is a fortress of of lies that the enemy has built up in the minds of those who do not know the truth. Okay? If you know the truth of the Word of God, church, the enemy can't build a stronghold in your mind if you know the truth. Okay? You get what I'm saying? If you have the truth written on your mind and the truth is written on your heart, the enemy can't talk you out of the truth because you know the truth. All right? 
you know the truth, and the truth will set you free, like the Word of God says, right? So if you know the truth, the enemy can't deceive you. But if you don't know the truth, if you only read your Bible just a little bit, and you only live the Christian life just a little bit, the enemy is able to deceive you in all these different areas that you don't have knowledge in. That's what he does. You remember the parable of the sower? How the first guy who had the heart in heart, how the, the birds came and stole the seed that was sown on the ground because the, the seed was sown on the wayside? Remember, the wayside is the heart. And if, you're, if your heart is hardened to the Word of God, then the enemy can come and snatch up everything I'm telling you right now. If you don't take everything I'm telling you right now and live it in your life, the, the enemy will come and take the Word of God that I'm sowing into your hearts right now. He'll come in like a bird. He'll swoop that seed up, and it will never grow a root in your body. It will never grow a root in your mind. It will never grow a root in your spirit because you won't take it in. Don't let your hearts be hardened by this world. Let your hearts be engrafted with the Word of God. Let everything that I'm telling you go, go penetrate your heart. Because that's the truth of the Word of God. And the only way that what I'm telling you right now can penetrate your heart is if you go out and live it. You get your Word. You get the Bible. You study it out. All right. It's what Pastor Anthony is saying. Is it true? Let's look in the Word of God. Spend time with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, the Bible says you're the teacher. Now, is what Pastor Anthony is saying, is it the truth? Show me the truth, Holy Spirit, and seek the Word out, read the Word, study it, and He will reveal that truth to you. And when you get the revelation of that truth, then that revelation gets planted in your heart. Then it starts growing roots, and then it starts sprouting, and then eventually you get a fruit, a fruit of righteousness, a fruit of whatever it is you are praying for, a fruit of God's truth. But if you don't do that, all the enemy's going to do is come and destroy the word and take it away from you. And everything I'm telling you now will be a waste. Well, to you personally, not to the people who have the fertile ground in the heart to receive the word. Now, you ever get what I'm saying? Now, I know that that's nobody here in this church, but I'm just saying that's how that works. That's how that process works. So you have to know the truth because only the truth can set you free. And we'll talk more about that in another teaching. Now, what wisdom does the word offer us for this fight. What wisdom does the word offer us for this fight and the weapons that God has given us? Let's see what God says about it. Look at 1 Timothy 6 and 12. It says, To fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you are called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now this scripture, you've heard, everybody's heard the good fight of faith, right? Everybody's heard fight the good fight of faith. Well, a lot, when people say that, they don't realize it's spiritual warfare. Like, it's, it's a fight for your life sometimes. And lay, ho <clears throat> lay hold on eternal life to which you are called. So we, her, eternal life is something we live out. If we're called to do it, that's something we've lived out and should be living out. And we're supposed to have a good profession before many witnesses, a good confession. Now, we're going to break this down because this scripture actually reveals instructions for spiritual warfare. You may not see it, but this scripture actually has... How, uh, tells us how we should fight this war that we're in. Now, Strong's Concordance um, has the definitions. It's basically the biblical definitions of everything that's in Scripture. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to get the words in here, and I'm going to highlight them, and I'm going to form them into a summarized definition of what Strong's, or what the Bible dictionary says. So the first word is profess. What does profess mean? Profess is homologio. Homologio. It means to confess and agree with as being true in the presence of witnesses. So if God is saying we're supposed to have a good profession, that means we're supposed to be agreeing with what the Word of God says. And we're supposed to confess it to other people. Okay? Confess it to other people because it says in the presence of witnesses, so we know that the Word of God is supposed to be shared. Amen? Well, now what about faith? Faith is the Greek word pistis. It means the full assurance and conviction of the truth of God's word and character. The full assurance and conviction of the truth of God's word means you know that you know that you know. And there's nothing that can possibly happen to shake your faith because you know the truth. It's just like, I mean, say there was a big giant pit of lava in front of you. Do you think there's anybody in this world that can talk you out of saying, oh, you jump in there, you won't burn, you'll be fine. No, it'll be good. You'll walk out of there, no problem. Would you believe there's no, not a person in the world that could talk you out of that? Why? Because you know that fire burns. You know that if it's hot enough, it'll melt the skin right off your body. You know that. Why? Because that's been seated in your heart as truth. You have faith for that. You know you are convinced that if you step in that law, well, you're going to burn, period. And no one can talk you out of it. That's how you're supposed to be with the Word of God. That's how you're supposed to be with all His promises. You're supposed to know without a doubt 
that when God says something, he means it and it's going to get done, period. And nobody can talk you out of it. That's how we have to be with our faith. And if we are not that way in our faith, then all that means is we have work to do. And the only way you can get your faith is by doing what the Bible says. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? So you have to hear faith and hear faith and hear faith. You don't want to hear unbelief. You don't want to hear preachers in the pulpit that are teaching garbage, that are teaching, oh, well, God put sickness on you to, to teach you a lesson. Oh, well, God caused this to happen to you because of X, Y, and Z. And I said, no, you know what? Sin's been paid for. Sin's been taken care of. It's no longer a sin issue. It's an obedience issue. It's a, a reaping and sowing issue. So you've got to be mindful of what you're hearing from people. Just because they're a pastor in a pulpit does not mean that they know what they're doing, number one. And number two, does not mean they even have the truth written on their hearts. They may have a nefarious, they may be a puppet of the devil, sent there, a messenger of Satan, sent there to mess with you, sent, sent there to destroy the body of Christ. You never know who's in the pulpit. So you always judge the people in the pulpit by the word of God. Just like everything I'm telling you here, don't take my, my word for it. Go out and study it yourself. That's why I put so many scriptures in here. Because I don't want to give you my opinion. I want to give you the truth, which is the word of God. Amen? So fight means to struggle, strive, endeavor, to labor fervently. Fervently to accomplish something, to compete for a prize. In other words, to contend with an adversary. So any, if you've ever been in a fight before, you know that you're giving it your all. You're giving it everything you have to win. And that's how we treat the devil. You give it everything you have to win. You don't, not, you not, you, you don't give the devil an inch. Nothing, because he'll take a mile. Okay? So you have to make sure that when you're, when you're fighting, that you're giving it your all. And I'll tell you the secret right here. That's the secret to, to scaring the devil out of your life. If the devil knows you like to fight, if he knows that, oh man, every time I try to do this to so and so, every time I try to do this to someone, they meet me with such ferocity. They're so violent towards me. The devil's finally going to give up. You know what? I'm not going to mess with that dude because every time I try to push his button right here, he just he gives it all. He gives it his all. He's, he loves to fight with me. So if we, 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 if we love to fight the devil and we have that kind of attitude toward, towards him, I say, bring it on. You want to fight? Let's fight, devil. When we act that way towards him and we mean it and, he tests, and he'll test us, and when he sees that we fight back every single time, guess what? He's going to back off because he's a coward. So don't be a coward because the devil is a coward. And the only way you can overcome a coward is by having the, the, the ferocity of the gospel. And what I mean by that, having that, that fight, that desire to just punch the devil into the ground, to just crush him under your heel. When you love to do that to the devil and he knows that you love to crush him, man, he will not touch you. You will become untouchable. And that is possible. Amen? So... In order to fight and win a spiritual battle, you must profess your faith with absolute conviction in the presence of the enemy. You got to let him know that you mean business. You got to let him know that he cannot push your buttons and get away with it. Everything that I was just saying, it's a culmination in this statement. And this, the Holy Spirit is the one who told me this. When I was originally putting this teaching together, and this teaching is already old, but what he told me was this exact words. He says, in order to fight and to win a spiritual battle, you must profess your faith with absolute conviction in the presence of the enemy because he's the one who you need to convince. Not the people around you, the enemy in the spirit. He's the one who you have to convince that, hey, you know what? What you're doing is not going to work. I will slap you and I will meet you with a vengeance and you will lose every time. And when he knows that you believe that, he backs off. So how do we profess our faith? How do we profess our faith? Now look at 1 Peter 5, 9. He says to resist. Number one, resist him steadfast. That means unwavering. When you resist the devil steadfast, that means your faith is unshakable. You don't change your mind. You know what you're doing, and you're going to do it till it's done. He says, so resist him steadfast, unwavering in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren, brethren that are in the world. So you're not special. You're not alone. Everybody's getting persecuted. Everybody. Now, notice what Peter said. We are to resist Satan. Now, why does Peter want us to resist Satan? Well, James 4, 7 explains that a little bit more. This is why you want to resist him. It says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. And what? What does it say? He will flee from you if you resist him. If you do not resist Satan, he will not flee from you. You must resist him at all costs. You cannot let the devil have 
an iota of anything in your life, not in your mind, not in your heart, not in your soul, nothing. So you have to resist them. So as soon as the devil tries to come into your life, if he tries to come in through a thought, he said, Lord, I bind that thought in the name of Jesus because I know it's from Satan because you don't think like that, Jesus. I have the mind of Christ. I take that thought right now in the name of Jesus and I cast it down. I cast down that vain imagination, just like your word says. So you're resisting him. But if you let that thought keep going in your mind, guess what? It goes to your heart. Then it starts planting root. And eventually you produce a fruit for it. So if it was an evil thought, an evil, wicked or evil desire... Like say, for example, you know, say it's a sin to eat cake, right? So if he keeps telling you, eat cake, eat cake. If you don't cast that thought down immediately, it gets into your heart. And then the desire to eat cake will be so overwhelming that you won't be able to control it anymore. And then you eat the cake and then sin has come to fruition. Sin has come to pass. Uh, come to pass because you let it marinate in your heart, in your, in your mind. Then it went to your heart and then it came out in the real world because you didn't cast it down. You have to immediately cast the thought down. Everybody with me? Amen? So if you resist him, he will flee. But what does it mean to resist? Well, look at the word resist. It means to take a firm stand against an opponent, to hold one's ground, refusing to be moved, to forcefully, forcefully declare one's personal conviction without giving up. And that's the hard part right there. Because some people are so tormented by the enemy they can't take the pain. They can't take the discomfort. If it's a sickness, they can't handle it anymore. So they will take medicine. They will do this. They will do whatever they can to be in a position where they are no longer being tormented. Because it's not a good feeling to be tormented. Whether it's mental anguish, whether it's a physical infirmity, whatever it is, it doesn't feel good to be hurting emotionally or physically. And the devil knows that. So what you're supposed to do is that no matter how much it hurts, he's, the, re, the definition of resist is no matter how much it hurts, you need to push and push and fight and confess the word of God until you win. Until you win, but you have to push. At all costs, you cannot give up. And that's where most Christians fail because they give up. They'll go to the hospital or they'll go take the medicine or, or they'll just let the enemy have his way or they'll let vengeance overtake the heart. Whatever it is, they give up. And so the enemy is able to have his way in you because we give up. But the Bible says, he promises that if we don't, if we don't give up, if we continue to resist it, the enemy will eventually flee. But sometimes that waiting period is very long, depending on how, how ferocious you are resisting him. So the more... Uh, power and desire to destroy the enemy that you meet him with, the quicker he will flee. So the, the, the more ferocious you are towards the enemy, the quicker he will flee. You get what I'm saying? So when the enemy shows up, man, you just, you just lose it on him. Put it like that. You just go all out on him. You let him know that you mean business and you're not taking it. And he will leave a lot faster. But if you're like, oh, Mr. Devil, would you just please leave me alone today? I, I just don't feel like a day. I only got three hours of sleep. He's going to laugh at you and he's going to pound you even harder. You have to resist him. Amen? All right. So look at this. In order to fight and win a spiritual battle, just like I said, you must profess your faith with absolute conviction in the presence of the enemy. And that's why the Holy Spirit told me that. Because it's everything that I just told you. Now the Word is telling us that when you are resisting the devil, you are reinforcing your victory. Because remember what I said in the very beginning, that you have to keep in mind that this, fa this fight we have, this battle we have, it's already won. We've already got it won in Jesus. Okay, we don't have to worry about losing. The victory is already there, so all we're doing is reinforcing it. We're reminding the devil that he is a defeated foe. Okay, so we're reminding him that he is defeated. However, if you're fighting the enemy, that means he's made it past your resistance. And you are trying to push him out. So if you're trying to push the devil out of your life, that means he's already made it in. You resist him so he doesn't come in. But if you're trying to push him out, he's already in. You get what I'm saying? That's why you want to resist him. In other words, Satan roamed around long enough in your life to find a kink in your armor, and he slowly made his way in, unsuspecting your life. And then all of a sudden you wake up and you have this huge battle in front of you because you let him in, unsuspectingly. You didn't know that all these things that he's been putting in your life over the course of, of years was going to culminate in him trying to destroy you three years later. You didn't know that. But had you... Um, been close to God's heart, you would have been able to see what the enemy is trying to do. That's why it's so important to have a relationship with Jesus. That's why it's so important to live your Christianity out so the devil cannot sneak up on you and do this to you. Now, resisting and fighting, they're not the same thing. Now, Peter said in verse 5, 9, 
that we are to resist Satan in the faith. In the faith. Now let's look at those definitions again. Remember, faith is the full assurance and conviction of the truth of God's word and character. Full assurance, all doubt removed, right? Okay. But what's the source of our faith? Hebrews 12.2 says, Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The source of our faith is in Jesus. And Jesus went to the cross because he loved us. He suffered and endured the hardships he did with the ripping of his flesh and the piercing on the cross because he loved us. And it even says in Isaiah that it pleased God to do that to Jesus, because God knew that doing that would set the whole world free. So they loved the righteousness and holiness, and the only way we could be delivered is by sending Jesus to the cross, sending him to be flogged and have his flesh ripped from him. That was the only way we could have our healing and the only way we could have our salvation. And it pleased God to know that that would happen. Now, how does faith come? I told you earlier. 10.17, Romans 10.17, so faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, there's two points for this. For this scripture right here, faith comes by hearing the word. So you have to listen to the word, right? You have to listen to the word. And the only way the word becomes real in your life, the only way you truly believe it is by doing the word. Because remember, in James it says, don't just be a hearer of the word, you must also be a doer of the word. So there's two sides of that, co of that coin. So hearing means to hear and then do. Okay? In order for it to be real, you have to hear, then do. Now what did John say about the word? Well, in John 1, he said, in the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word was with who? The Word was with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was made flesh, and then He dwelt among us. That's what he said. So what the Scripture is really saying is that our faith, our faith comes from hearing the voice of Jesus, because Jesus is the Word. You get what I'm saying? Jesus is the Word. So when you're listening to Scripture that I read to you, you're, you're, what you're doing is you're hearing the voice of Jesus. You get what I'm saying, church? You're hearing the voice of Jesus. And faith comes by hearing the voice of Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, if faith comes, if faith overcomes the enemy, then faith is a strength. Okay? And our strength comes from hearing the voice of Jesus. It comes from hearing the voice of Jesus. Now remember I said that resisting and fighting are not the same. Remember when I said that? Well, let's take a look at the rest of the definitions. Resist, remember, remember it says to take a firm stand against the opponent, to hold your ground, refusing to be moved, to forcefully declare with a personal conviction without giving up. In other words, you pin the devil to the corner and you don't let him out. You back him up to the corner and say, look, devil, it's going to be my way. So you hit the highway. Okay, that's what it means to forcefully declare. And fight means to struggle to endeavor, to labor, fervently. Whenever you're laboring fervently, it means you're working really hard, blood, sweat, and tears, right? To get to live out this truth, to accomplish something, to be compete, to compete for a prize, to contend with an adversary. So when you're fighting the enemy, you're struggling and you're laboring to hear the voice of Jesus. When the enemy has made it past your defenses, when you didn't resist him in the beginning, the enemy's made it in his life, made it into your life, when you start fighting with him, all that means is you are struggling to hear the voice of Jesus. Because if you're, if you're hearing the voice of Jesus and you're doing his will, then you have strength and faith in your heart to defeat the enemy. But if you're having a hard time defeating the enemy, it's because his voice is louder than Jesus' voice. That means you hear the devil's voice more than you hear the scripture's voice. That's, that's when you know you have a fight in your hand, when you are struggling. Because when you know that you know, and the devil comes knocking, you slap him down immediately and it's over right there. But if you're struggling with something in your life, it's because you are in a fight. You are in a spiritual battle with the enemy, and you are struggling to hear the voice of Jesus in your life. That's the only reason why you would struggle. Because if you do hear the voice of Jesus, then you have peace in your heart, and you know that the devil can't touch you. And that adversary is squashed, and he's done. And you don't have to worry about it anymore. So that's something to remember, that if you are struggling with something in your life, it's because you're struggling to hear the truth. And the truth is Jesus, and the truth sets you free. Now, we always want to be in that position where we are resisting instead of fighting because it's easier to defend from the high ground. It's easier to defend when you already have your heel of your boot on the throat of the enemy. It's easy to defend yourself from there because the devil knows his position, which is under your heel, and you know your position, which is standing over the coward. That's where we should always be. That's the position we always want to fight from. That's like the throne room versus the flesh.
And that's exactly what the enemy tries to do. He tries to bring you down to his level so you can fight with him. And that's why Peter warned us in verse 5, 8 to be sober. That means to be alert, to understand that the enemy is coming to get you. Okay, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may desire, who he will devour. But if you're always on edge, church, if you're always watching, you're always listening, you're always just looking for the enemy, he knows you're looking for him, and he's, gonna, he's not going to come anywhere near you because you're expecting him. But if you're not suspecting him, you're too tied up in the things of the world. Whether and It doesn't have to be bad when I say the things of the world. It just means you can be so busy at work that you don't have time to read your Bible. You don't have time to witness. That's you being consumed with the things of the world. You know, I mean, it's your job. You've got to do your job. I get it. But if you forget to consider God while you're doing your job, the enemy's going to try to sneak in. Just like this new job that I have. I'm so busy over there that if I did not pray throughout the entire day, I would not be able to stay spiritually sharp and spiritually aware of the enemy's surroundings. So I have to force myself sometimes to stay in the Word, even though I'm working, you know, and, and my fingers are moving 100 miles an hour. I have to make a point of it to stay in the Word because if I don't, the enemy will start sneaking into my life because I'm so taken away by the things of this world. And I have to work. I have to provide for my family. So I know I have to do that job. There's no avoiding that. But that does not mean that I can't serve God at the same time. That doesn't mean that I can't stay prayed up at the same time. So sometimes being a Christian is hard. It's hard work. But you got to do it. Because if you don't, the devil will eat you up, man. He's not, he doesn't care. He's not going to have sympathy on you. Oh, well, he's working three jobs. And, you know, I'm just going to leave him alone today because I feel bad for him. He don't do that. He's going to use that opportunity to destroy you if you let him. Are you going to let him? Are you going to let him? No, of course not. That's why you got to be sober. you got to be vigilant. Because he is walking around looking for you. Now, that being said, you know what the enemy's greatest strength is? Now, this is a great revelation right here. Now, listen to what I'm saying, and I want you to really think about this. What is the enemy's greatest strength? Because once I tell you the enemy's greatest strength, you'll be undefeatable. I don't know if you've ever heard this before. A lot of people have not heard what I'm about to tell them. The enemy's greatest strength, and this isn't a word of God, but it gets overlooked by even the most seasoned pastors. The greatest strength of the enemy is your weakness. Your weakness. Your weakness. That is the greatest strength of the enemy is your weakness. So find out what your weakness is and be an overcomer. Destroy that weakness so the enemy will have nothing against you. Nothing at all. Amen? Amen. All right. The kink in your armor, that's your weakness, church. And we're not going to let him have his way. We're almost done here, church. You want a little bit more? You want a little bit more of the enemy? Yeah? A little bit more? You want to learn a little bit more about the enemy? Amen? Now look at this. Ephesians 4 and 26. The short answer is sin. Sin is how he makes his way into your life, but Satan prefers a certain type of sin. Now look at this. We're almost done here. Ephesians 4, 6, 20, uh, 4 26. It says, Be ye angry and sin not. And let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Never give place to the devil. So no matter what's going on in your life, do not let the enemy in at all costs. Because sin gives place to the devil. Anger, unforgiveness, wrath gives place to the devil. And we have all been there before. Okay, So we cannot let him in. Psalms 10 and 4. It says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. Because God is not as all his thoughts. So if God does not consume your thoughts... If you're not thinking about God day in and day out, all that is is an opportunity for, this, for Satan to interject something into your mind that's not from God. So you must be meditating on God all day long. This is how sin lets the enemy in, is in the times when you are idle, the times where you're not seeking God, the times where you're not thinking about God, even if it's innocent thoughts, oh, I've got to fix that part of my car, or, or this, that. Even in that moment when you're not focusing on the Lord, the enemy will try to come in. I look at Proverbs 13.10. But only by pride comes contention. Contentions, you know, it's just fighting. Contentions amongst each other. It's disagreements, fighting. And it's all motivated by pride. Now look at Proverbs 28 and 25. He that is of a proud heart stirs up strife. So we know that strife is fueled by pride. And what's strife? It's a selfish desire to put yourself forward to win by unfair means, contentious, a person who is likely to cause a disagreement or an argument. So if you're in strife, you're those people that says, 
I'm going to get this position. I'm going to get this promotion. I don't care who I got to step on. I don't care whose toes I got to crush. I'm getting what I want and that's it. Isn't that what just happened in the elections? Look at all the strife. They did whatever they could to win. Whether you believe it or not, the evidence was all there. They did everything in their evil power to win. And they did. But God doesn't recognize that. Because the Bible says that if a person wins a race by unfair means, God will not recognize that person as the winner. So God does not recognize Biden as president. And if you want to, I did a video on that. If you want to go online and see that video, you can see that. Now look at James 3.16. It says, for where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Every evil work. Wherever you see jealousy, wherever you see strife, there's always going to be confusion there. And every evil work will be along with it. Now here's another one. Look at this. 2 Corinthians 2.10-11. Anyone whom, you, anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake. So I forgive people for your sake in the presence of Christ. Because we know Jesus is always watching. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan. You see what's happening here? For we are not ignorant of his designs. And in the original language, it calls it devices. In King James, it calls it devices. A device is something that's built for a specific purpose. For a specific purpose. Just like if I got a buffer for a vehicle. A buffer, what's a buffer do? It buffs the paint. Gets impurities out. So Satan will develop devices for a specific reason to destroy something in your life. But it says right here that if you don't, if you don't walk in forgiveness, you're going to get outwitted by Satan. You're going to get outwitted by Satan if you don't walk in forgiveness. Because that pride, that pride and the hardness of heart will cause Satan to come into your life and outwit you. Have you ever been in an argument with somebody before that while you were arguing, you, you knew you were right? You knew that you were right? And you stood your ground, but after it was all over, there was more devastation and destruction than what you thought was going to happen. But during that moment, during the heat of the moment, you know, I knew it was right, I stood my ground, but after the dust had settled, you realized that you did more damage than anything else by standing your ground. Well, guess what? You just got outwitted by Satan. That's what happened. Because you let your pride consume you. You let your pride get the best of you. And instead of making peace and giving love, we gave them a piece of our mind. Even if we were justified by the world standard, we gave them a piece of our mind. But in the end, all you did was crush that person's soul. And now you're in a worse position. And that person's going to have a hard time forgetting what they experienced from you emotionally. Fighting and hate and strife, that is never the answer. It always causes division. And that's how the Satan outwits you, is by causing you to do stuff like that or influence you to do stuff like that. And says he just wants to be uh, ignorant because that's how his designs work. So the enemy loves the sin of pride, envy, for unforgiveness, and strife. In other words, the enemy uses pride, bitterness, envy, strife to destroy relationships. He uses all these things to destroy relationships because the enemy wants to separate you from the ultimate relationship, which is what? With God. With God. With Jesus. That's the ultimate relationship you can have. And if he can separate you from him, then he can separate you from everything you hold dear in your life. Everything. Now, through these sins of, of pride and forgiveness, jealousy, strife, all these are sins, all right? And through these sins, the enemy is able to execute three steps in his war campaign. He studies us. He finds a way in. He breaks you down to his level where you are fighting instead of resisting and you're struggling to hear the voice of Jesus. And third, he gets you so focused on him and what he's doing in your life and the destruction he's reaping in your life that you completely drown out the voice of Jesus. And that's the ultimate goal. He wants to cause so much problems in your life that all you can see is problems. And you can no longer see Jesus. You can no longer hear Jesus because he's beating you up from the left, from the right, from the top to the bottom, in front of you, behind you. Everywhere you turn, the enemy's trying to destroy you. And that's all you see. And that's his whole point, to get you to that point where you're drowning in misery. And that's what happens when you take your eyes off of Jesus. That's what happens when you don't live the Christian life. He's able to do those three things. And he will achieve the main goal of his war campaign, which is to separate you from your identity in Jesus. Because your identity in Jesus is your real victory. That's where your guaranteed victory is at, is in Jesus. So the devil's ultimate goal is to separate you from that power that is able to deliver you. And he does this by getting your eyes off of Jesus. 
and on to the problem. How many, how many times has that ever happened in your life that all you could see was a problem because the problem was so big? The problem was so overwhelming that that's literally all you could see. That's his goal, is to get you so focused on the problem that you can no longer hear Jesus, you can no longer see Jesus, and you can no longer walk as a Christian anymore. So I want to close with this last thought. What are you supposed to do when that happens? When the devil attacks you like that, when he gets you and pins you? There's two things. Number one, you have to remember what the Holy Spirit said. Okay, That in order to fight and win a spiritual battle, you must, at absolute, all costs, you must profess your faith with absolute conviction in the presence of the enemy. So if the devil has you pinned in a corner, come out, just swing. Swing with everything you got. And every swing you have is the word of God. You're throwing scripture at the devil and you're hammering it. Even if you don't believe it fully in your heart, you convince it and you yell it and you scream it and you live it until it becomes the truth in your heart. You fight yourself out of that corner. And once you're out in the open, then you start taking, you start taking them out, chopping the devil at the knees by convincing that scripture, by walking in righteousness, okay? Now what do you get when we add the Holy Spirit statement right here, what do you get when you add this statement to the definition at the bottom of, oh, you don't have sheets today. What do you get when you add this definition into everything we've talked about? Because remember how we had everything in order? We talked about the profession of our faith and we talked about the uh, resisting and fighting, all those definitions we gave. When you put all those definitions together, this is what it spells. You must profess your faith to resist the fight. We gave definitions for each one of these for profess, for faith, for resistance, and for fight. And when you put them all in order, it says we must profess our faith to resist the fight. So in order to avoid getting into the fight with the devil, if you resist him in the very beginning by casting down those thoughts, because that's how he comes in, then you'll never have a fight on your hands. You'll always walk in victory. Because remember, church, you only fight when he's already made it in to your life. You're only fighting him when he's made it past your defenses. When he's found the kink in your armor, when he roamed around long enough to find a kink in your armor and he's made his way into your life, that's when you have the fight. Other than that, you're just resisting him. And when, what, what is it when you resist him? When you resist him, all you're doing is confessing your victory to him. Say, I already got this, devil. You can't bring sickness against me because the Bible says this. You can't bring poverty against me because the Bible says this. You can't destroy my relationship because the Bible says this, devil. You have no place in my life. Depart from me. Leave now in Jesus' name. All you're doing is resisting him. And all that is, it means you're reinforcing the truth. The only time, church, you will ever have a fight on your hands is when the devil has made it past your defenses. When you didn't resist him. When you didn't cast down that thought and he's made his way in your life, then you have a battle on your hands. So profess your faith so you can resist the fight. Amen?